resource statement or that could go into the teaching statement, uh, for example. And so what we could do is really when you are thinking about the package itself, I always like to tell students and postdocs to map it, create a storyboard on having broad bullet points on what you think will go into your research statement, into your teaching statement, um, into your diversity statement. And then look at what portions of it you really can pull out into your cover letter to provide the context of what's going to come in the different parts of the package. And all of this really, like I said, will be you know, informed by the kinds of institutions you are applying to and what their priorities and goals are. And so I always like to start off with this, just like a data context on the types of academic institutions in the United States. A lot of us in the life science and in biomedicine, um, you know, really look at what we call the R1 and the R2 institutions. So these annotations or notations, if you've used them in the past, comes from what's called the Carnegie classification that classifies higher ed institutions in based on their research activity and research intensity. And so the higher, the R1 institutions are the doctoral universities that have graduate and postdoc programs with a very high research activity. And you know, according to the data pulled in 2018, about 131 out of the 418 doctoral universities are R1. And then you have the next tier of R2 of the high research institutions, which are 135. But if you look at the other tiers of master's colleges, liberal arts colleges, community colleges, especially the community colleges, the majority of higher ed institutions are outside of your traditional R1, R2 institutions. Um, and then when you think about it, the goals of those institutions are different than the R1 institutions or the R2 institutions. There, they are probably going to look for more of your expertise and skills in teaching, in communicating ideas to a diverse student body, um, and less so about your research productivity and your ability to conduct independent research programs. Um, and so thinking about which kind of institution you want to cater to will inform the kind of application package you put together and what kind of like priorities you would put in the package itself. Um, also looking at beyond just the job description, the two different kinds of uh, platforms that you should be looking at to gather more data about the university is this uh, one is called the College Navigator. Um, and if you go onto that and look up any of the university that you're interested in, they'll give you the profile of the university, how many different students there are, the demographic size of the undergraduate, graduate population, postdoc population versus faculty. And the faculty to student ratio is an important thing to think about because if it's a faculty of student ratio is really skewed, you'll probably be able, like, expected to teach big classes. And so then in that context, you have to prepare early on to get more teaching experience where you are able to convince them that you are prepared to teach big undergraduate classes um, for say general chemistry or biology, et cetera. Um, also the NCES or National Center for Education Statistics conducts a lot of data and they have a lot of data on finances, like you know salaries, funding, et cetera, that you can look up in uh, regards to any of these institutions. So with that, let's launch into the purpose of the application package itself. And I can't say this enough, People spend a lot of time on their application package, but at the end of the day, what you really want from your application package is an interview. It stops being important once you get the interview. And so the goal of your application package is to actually make it attractive enough to get the first round of interview. And then having it at least you know, in a more distilled fashion, when you are actually going for different interviews, someone can skim through your CV or cover letter in 10, 15 seconds or a minute before the interview to remember, okay, what they wanted to ask you. So it has a recall value right before the interview. And so those are primarily the big goals of your application package. Get through the screening to the interview stage. And second is how it serves as a recall value during the interview that you have with different constituencies. With that in mind, 
I like to try and like classify the CV and cover letter as a what and why. The CV is a catalog of your experiences, your skills and education, and your marketability. The cover letter is your why. It's your narrative, it's your purpose, it's the argument you make to convince that you are interested in something and you are competitive for something. So think about it as the cover letter is your broad why, that will convince someone and CV will provide the evidence for it. So let's start with the CV and here, this is where we'll get into more of the basic elements of a CV, but I'll quickly run through most of them. Um, and a lot of the examples that I'll bring up are from this template and a whole uh, you know, web page that our colleagues in UCSF's Office of Career and Professional Development have put together. Um, that iSchool or Coralie would put in the chat uh, for you. All right, so for the CV, some of the basic sections you are looking at are education, research, teaching, and administration and service to show that you're a good departmental citizen, your professional experiences and affiliations with different national and professional societies, and letter references for letter of recommendation. Um, Based on which kind of university you are going to apply to, your priority of research and teaching and the uh, what comes first is going to change, like I already kind of uh, mentioned in the beginning. The second part of a CV to keep, uh, you know, really think about while you are thinking about the sections is what goes under each section. And we write a lot of bullet points under each of our experiences. But a lot of our bullet points fall into the first or the second category of a boring bullet point, where it's either just your paper or you just kind of minimize your um, you know, contribution by saying you're part of a team that did something. But when you're really thinking about how to make an effective description under a section heading, think about what, how you would tell that story in a sentence. Um, so you know, the, this is a quote from the founder of Oyster, who said like, you know, the great bullet point would start with something that really highlights what portions of a project, research project you were involved in, whether it was development of a collaboration, coordinating different groups, or thinking of yourself as a project manager, because what you're trying to convince at the faculty stage is that you can lead an independent research program, not just your technical skills, your leadership skill is important. And so through something like this, which shows that you initiated collaborations where you coordinated, the research goals across different teams, which the resulted in the outcome or output of it was uh, so-and-so publication. You can do citation metrics if you want or patents, et cetera, that you want through that or funding. And so this itself is so meaty that in reality, you are probably going to break this up into two or three bullet points. So in the way that for a lot of the academic CVs, it ends up working out, is you know this example that our colleagues and UCSF has put together for a hypothetical you know candidate from the Game of Thrones uh, working with another hypothetical candidate from the Game of Thrones. So hopefully this brings a chuckle in um, while we're going through this. Okay, so in this like through their uh, postdoc and graduate uh, experience, they talk about how they. Um, break up their experience into different bullet points that highlight action items, action-driven bullet points and outcome-oriented bullet points. So where they talk about, first of all, what the purpose of the research project was, which is uncovering defects in pro protein BC signaling process, et cetera. And again, in the uh, you know parenthesis, you'll see the collaboration listed out what they did, what kind of techniques did they developed, if they were computational, what kind of pipelines they developed, and then what the outcomes for, from this research was, whether they were awarded funding somewhere or if they have publications from it. So in a manner of three to two to three bullet points or so, you've kind of given them the why, the what, and the outcomes uh, all packaged really well under one experience. And so that's what I would say you should strive for for each of your research and or teaching experience that you put in your CV. Think about what the goal was, what you ended up doing, and what the outcomes were. The third thing to think about while you're putting your CV and the package together itself is to look at the job description hard, because every job description for a faculty position 
is telling you a lot of stories and narratives that are embedded and hidden without, within what they are trying to say. So this is an example of an actual job description that was uh, that came out about two, one or two years back of assistant professor in development of biology in UCSF. And I'm just going to highlight a few things here. So let's give it a minute and just like read through this and we'll highlight the points that they make. So just if you were to analyze this job description without even knowing fully the profile of UCSF, there are some things you can tell from here. So when we look at it, and I've highlighted it in different colors, they start more with productive postdoc training research, developing a dynamic research program, research excellence in their field, all highlighted in yellow, which outlines the priorities given to research. And even before they talk about teaching, the first thing they say is dynamic research program in development biology and to contribute to teaching and training. So the way that they frame that sentence is research is priority number one, teaching is priority number two, right? And so that will inform that you'll start your CV with the research section before the teaching session. For a different university, it could have been flipped. And so the second is your the blue section, which kind of talks about contributing to teaching and training. And at some point, they talk also about exhibiting strength in teaching as well as in mentoring. So which means you are not only expected to teach the undergraduate courses, you are expected to mentor people in your lab. And there should be distinctions made in both of those, in both your experience as well as your philosophy of teaching large student body versus individual mentoring, right? And the third is more in the area of, you know, um, what to expect in terms of leadership and departmental citizenship. And this also goes into giving you an idea about the organization itself. And so in the green buckets, you could see that they've kind of listed, first of all, like the sentence before that areas of interest is pretty broad. There's diverse areas within DevBio itself that, you know, you could find alignment with. And then the second thing that they that I've highlighted in green, based on the area that you work in, you could be affiliate faculty in multiple different departments in biomedical sciences, in stem cell biology, in developmental biology. So there are multiple graduate programs. What we don't think about is what this means in terms of once you become a faculty, you could have access to graduate students and postdocs from multiple departments, but also each of those departments have distinctions in the way that administration works. You're not thinking about that when you're applying, but there are some things that you might want to keep in mind when you get to the interview stage to ask more questions about that. Like what, how, I, how are you going to be affiliating with all of these departments? Where would your primary appointment be? Things like that you should be asking about. The other thing, um, you know, that they highlight is, uh, in, uh, in addition to teaching and research, the community service that you are doing and your commitment to diversity and excellence, right? So you can, of course, expect you have to write a de diversity statement, but also think more deeply about how you would show community service or professional experience or volunteering as a way to communicate that you are a responsible scientist and you are you care about the future of our scientific training. So let's go back to the section, section headings of the CV and I'll run through each of them pretty uh, quickly. For the education one is pretty straightforward. Like, you know, it's standard prototype, you start with your PhD, reverse chronology, talk about which lab you were in or which graduate group you were in. You can tie, put the title of, of your dissertation and then work down into your master's or bachelor's, whichever you had going. Now then the whole big portion of the research comes uh, into picture. Under research, you would be looking at 
your research experiences, funding profile, publications, invited talks, as well as any awards and presentations, right? Um, the research interest, you'll go more into it in the research statement, uh, as well as highlight a little bit of it in the cover letter. However, when as one thing that I do advise students that is becoming a new thing in academic circles, at least, is similar to an abstract in a paper, try to have like a professional summary section at the top of your CV before you even get into the education resource, et cetera. And that professional summary would be just two bullet points to just outline what, who you are. Like you are a researcher with expertise and interest in so-and-so fields and what kind of teaching and volunteering and mentorship is your style. So think about if someone was to spend like five seconds on your CV, what they would like to know about you, that would get them interested to look at the rest of the CV, uh, almost like the abstract of a paper. How would you summarize your entire CV in two bullet points? What are the two most important things to look up, know about you in the professional summary? And when you put that summary, you can put in a little bit of research interest um, and also that could align with the job description you just looked at, like look at the fields that resonate most with your work and just put that as something as, uh, in your research interest. And so in the example uh, that I'm referring to through the UCSF templates, you know, we just looked at the major research experience. This already gets to uh, your current and previous research, as well as the funding portion of, of the, uh, the research section. That said, it behooves you to actually have separate sections on publications as well as funding, um, so that if somebody missed uh, anything under the bullet point, you have a separate section cataloging your publications. Um, some of you, if you are thinking about putting stuff which are under prep or submitted or under review, you can classify and categorize those sections. First, put everything that's published, put them in one place and then write submitted or you know under review a section for that and anything that's in prep a section for that same thing about funding it you know works well to actually have a separate section on funding and patents if you've had a good history of getting uh, awards and fellowships put them in a separate section in fact even like say what role you played if you were a co-investigator, if you were a key personnel, write it down. Like even if your PI is funding or an, like an IH fund or NSF fund, if you are one of the key project personnel, write that down. You contributed to that proposal. Write that down. It's fine. For presentations, and this is where it gets um, really varies based on the depth of your experience. If you've been invited to a lot of talks and you have over 50 or 100 presentations, don't try and list them all. Go with the most competitive ones. If you've presented, say, in Society of Neuroscience, which is a huge conference, or any of the Gordon conferences, definitely put that, right? Um, I also get questions about talks versus posters. I would definitely go with talks first and then posters, but put a mix of those if you really wants to put more. Departmental retreats and seminars, if you have a lot of talks, maybe leave them out. The whole idea of a selected presentation is you you can say if you have, say, 10 or 15 presentations you've given, you can highlight eight or nine of them. And you can even say selected presentation brackets eight of 15 or nine of 15. In this case, it helps to have either your LinkedIn or your uh, separate personal web page, which includes all of the presentations and publications. And you can link that to your CV so that if someone's in, like interested in looking up everything, they can go into that um, web page. Uh, this is especially important if you have a lot of talks. If you don't have more than 10 talks, it's fine to include 10 talks. And finally, the honors and awards you won, um, you know, fellowships and et cetera, great. But like outside of that as well, if you won any teaching awards, anything for leadership, et cetera, for your uh, um, undergraduate, graduate or postdoc scholar um, activities, add that in a separate honors and awards section. Finally, for the teaching part as well, um, 
really think about in terms of the experiences, how you would highlight your role. And this is where a lot of people don't think or detail it as much. If you have been a course instructor, write the course title, also write what your responsibilities were. Did you design the course? Did you teach it with your a faculty member? If you were just a TA or a preceptor, then specify that, like put the responsibilities. What did you do? Did you prepare the course content? Did you, you know, grade the papers? What were you doing in that course? So that people know exactly what kind of experiences you have. And this also helps you in thinking about what your gaps are and what are the areas that you really need to develop to make a competitive application package in terms of teaching. The third thing that you saw in that UCF SF saying was a distinction made to teaching and mentoring. And so this is where you can shine as science researchers. If you mentored a lot of undergraduate or graduate students, make a separate section on students mentored. Again, one thing to remember, if you're gonna list their names, get their permission. If not, at least make just a bullet point on how many graduate students you've mentored in the lab and how many undergraduate, summer undergraduate programs um, through programs you've mentored. Uh, for my section, what I did was I listed the number of summer undergraduate uh, researchers I've mentored and also listed specifically if they were part of like NSFREU or a summer undergraduate research fellowship, what programs they were coming from, which are recognized if they are from NSF, et cetera, you contributed to something that's a national program. So this is another place to like highlight that. And finally, the administrative service and professional experience section. The goal of this is to show your leadership skills, to show that you'll be a good collaborator, a good departmental citizen for the sort of departmental and university-wide activities that are important for faculty career because they also have some sort of implications and measurement of success in your tenure package. So show that who you are outside of your research and teaching in these sections. And so you can, like, this is where if you've been part of postdoc associations, if you've done a lot of work in diversity, equity, inclusion, or you've done science outreach work, anything you've done through your postdoc or graduate school, some people even do, like, you know, if you have, if you are a competitive sports person or have uh, leadership in sports, you can list those as well to show leadership skills. So whatever you have been doing through your academic track career, put that in a separate leadership experience. And finally, any sort of professional affiliations, this becomes more important once you become a faculty and you are invited to any of these. But even now, if you're a member or an affiliate of a, a you know organization, just list them. It doesn't matter uh, to have a little section on that. Um, and especially like, and again, like for the references, think about who, who you would add as your references. It's kind of expected you would at least have either your graduate or postdoc advisor, maybe both. But while you're listing them as your reference, do identify who you who are they in relation to you, like you, why, why you are listing them. Professor A was your postdoc advisor, Professor B was your graduate advisor. Who how do they know you? How, in what capacity they work with you? Should we take a quick minute if there are any questions before I move on to the cover letter portion? Uh, I mean, we don't have any question, but people can, because I mean, feel free to share, type your questions so we can answer at the last if you want, Sonali. Sounds good. So yeah, this is a time for you. If you have any questions or thoughts from the CV section, please list them in the chat. So we'll get to it at the end of today's presentation. Um, all right. So the next uh, few minutes I'll spend on just kind of highlighting what are some things to keep in mind when you are putting your cover letter together. So the basics of cover letter, like I said, the cover letter is your purpose statement, um, your why. And so it's one way of persuasive writing in persuading someone that you're competitive for the position you're applying for, which means you have to take an employer's point of view. You have to really think about what they want and why they should even take a chance on interviewing you, right? And so tailor it to the position as specifically as possible so that they can see the alignment right away. Don't make them guess on anything, say it out loud. And this is something that I've seen 
cultural differences in the United States, people just explicitly say it, right? And so now I get to read different kinds of cover letters and I'm, I am surprised by, you know, how straightforward letters get to the point really quickly. And those are most effective. You're, you do, you're not necessarily being arrogant. You're just saying exactly why someone you think you are um, fit for this job. And so uh, the cover letter intentionally expresses the interest for your position and explains why you are the best candidate. Um, illustrates your qualifications um, and the alignment with what they're looking for. And it's a place where, which contextualizes pretty much the rest of your application from your CV to your research statement, to your teaching statement, to your diversity statement. This is the place where you will summarize and contextualize every part of the application. And you will like recall saying, as I highlighted or outlined in my research statement, my research interest will fill this gap or this question in the field and advance the field in this way. So summarize every other component into the cover letter. Um, it also helps to write the cover letter last in your application package. That way you know what the other parts of the package looks like and how you would summarize the key elements of the other parts of the package to make a compelling argument in your cover letter. In typically in terms of formats, it's like one to two pages um, and again, most universities will ask for a separate research and teaching statement. If they don't, you have to include some elements of that statement in the cover letter, but generally they are separate from a longer teaching statement or a research statement. Um, it focuses on the goals and the needs of the institution and tells them why you would fit into their goals. Um, and so you have to use more about, take that approach of, fitting your perspective into their goals instead of just going with I, 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 this is who I am. Why should they care? Every sentence you write, always ask, why should they care? So every sentence has an intent that aligns to something they're asking for in the job description. Um, using your institutional a letterhead gives a little bit more like, you know, cr credibility and professionalism. Um, and the style and format, again, should be consistent across the board. If you're using Arial 11, use Arial 11 for everything. Um, have the same style and format. All right, so in terms of writing it up, um, it typically starts with introducing yourself, um, who you are, what kind of uh, background you have, you know, your training, your expertise and skills, and again, tailoring it to the language that was used in the job description is sort of like the motto of every part of your application. For the research paragraph that you'll do, which is typically the second paragraph after you've done the intent of expression of interest and who you are in your background in the introductory paragraph. This is where you describe what your current research in a sentence, maybe two. Um, if you are a graduate student, not a postdoc, you could include, you know, just the main topics or the chapters of your dissertation. If you have substantial research experience for, after your graduate school, don't allude too much to your dissertation. Just talk about the journey of what has. And so this is your like narrative. This is the story that you're putting together in the cover letter. So even saying you're connecting your future interest to your past experience. What got you to do the research in your graduate level, your postdoc level, and how that connects to the decision you're wanting to make in, um, in investigating the research area you're making. That's what people want to read. What, what people will get you know, attracted to is your human story behind the science, and that's what they would like to kind of see more of you in the interview for. And so try to bring in your humanity through your story. Um, and then in the research part itself, like talking about the broader impact of your research question and your research program on the field, which you would elaborate a lot more in the research statement. But when you summarize in the cover letter, you could say, as I outline in the research statement, my, my research directions or the, uh, the research program I'll design will fundamentally try to address these questions in the field that have been uh, struggles or challenges. Um, what are some current publication grants? And I also say like adding some 
interesting ideas for collaboration, especially with other researchers in that university is a hook to get people. Because some of those people might be reading your application. And if they see, oh, so, you know, this, this, this is an area that someone like me could help with, and they see their names outlined in the cover letter or the research statement, they'll probably be like, okay, this person's done their homework. homework. They're not coming at it blind. And giving at least one or two future research questions that you might want to ask, you'll go into detail for that in the research statement itself, but just a synopsis of what are the broad areas and topics of questions that you might want to ask, and what are some publications and grants you might want to apply to get uh, to make progress on those goals. Then there'll be a paragraph on summarizing your teaching commitment. Again, this summarizes what you write in the teaching statement. Broadly, what is your teaching philosophy? Again, your journey. How, how can you tie in your teaching experience so far with evidence on what is, you know, that is the evidence you provide to support your teaching philosophy. How do you approach assessment? How do you approach design of your classes? Um, if you want to put a specific section on mentoring under teaching, what is your philosophy to mentor and research, um, you know, scientists in your lab, especially those who are coming from very diverse backgrounds and may have been historically underrepresented in those fields? How would you curate and customize your mentorship style to make sure that everyone is learning and making progress? And finally, you would have a you know, another um, paragraph before the closing paragraph on communicating that you would be a good departmental citizen because faculty positions are typically pretty long. <laughs> Even if these days people move institutions, yes, but it's pretty safe to presume that you'll at least be in the same institution for three to five years longer sometimes, right? So most people in the interview want to work with someone who's a nice person um, and who's a you know, good departmental citizen, who is a collaborator, a team member with shared values and missions as that of the department and the institution. And so one way to really communicate that in your application is looking at how you can relate your administrative experience and service roles to show commitment to some of the shared values um, that the institution has. And so think about what those are, whether it's like, you know, work you've done through science outreach, work you've done in mentoring, what are those values and commitments you're making that aligns with the mission of the department and the institution? Um, it's easy to look it up on the uh, university's website, what their primary mission is, and then using similar language to show that what you have done kind of contributes to that overall mission itself. And again, so going back to it, if you were going to apply to this assistant professor in biology for UCSF, you would be tailoring your, tailoring your cover letter, which addresses each of these points and also looks at UCSF's mission um, outside of just the departments and what their broad mission is and how you would communicate who you are as a scientist, scholar, and faculty, independent, you know, uh, lab head and uh, departmental citizen to communicate that you have shared values. Um, and the, finally, the closing point of your cover letter would be um, just another closing statement on expression of interest and your interest in discussing further in the interview. So when you, uh, for a job description like this, it always helps whichever job description you're putting, you know, writing for, and this I've taken the cover letter as an example, but you could, when I said the storyboarding of your application, it's always helpful to break down the job description itself on what the role is, what are their key expectations. So taking specific language from the letter and breaking it down, and then seeing what portions of your application actually addresses their key expectation. Um, and when you are reading through at the end, you can see what part of it actually shows your, your ability to develop a dynamic research pro, uh, you know, program. What does a dynamic research program inherently mean? It means that you are flexible, 
you could move the direction of the research program based on what you find, based on where, where like sort of the field is moving and also where money is available. Um, and evidence of research excellence from your past and you know that can be extended to the future. So thinking about the arguments you're making in different parts of your application package, whether they actually get to the specific sentences that they're asking for in, in the research program, uh, in the job description. So inherently what would require, and again, cover letter is an example for the entire application package, and I talked about this a little bit, you have to do a little bit of research on the institution itself and the departments you're applying to, what their priorities and missions are, what does the university itself prioritize research or teaching, is it a public university or private? Um, I generally like to tell people to take more of a top-down view as well as bottoms-up view, and as crass as it sounds, sometimes follow the money, right? Um, there is another um, site called HERD or Higher Education Research Development. Go to that site, look up the institution of your interest, and see where their research dollars are coming from. What percent of it is federal money? What percent of it is institutional endowment? What percent of it is coming for for-profit, non-profit? And they're also split by fields. So you can look at your specific field where the money is coming from. And that would also help you understand how to really navigate your future in those institutions and start planning for that and communicating that like, you know, through your application material itself, that you are a smart um, independent scientist who can posi be positioned for a dynamic future. And it, it goes from really understanding where the research dollars come from and your ability to acquire them through multiple sources. And then taking doing some self-reflection on whether you see yourself being uh, productive, happy, and thriving in an institution that you're applying for. And a lot of this like you know information you'll get um, online through the student demographic information, through the financial package information um, on College Navigator, HERD, et cetera. And my last thoughts on this really are the most connections you can make with different parts of your application package to make a compelling argument and a cohesive argument through your application package, the likelihood is higher for you to get an at least the screening round of the interview. And at that point, you have to, you know, shine on your communication skills, like your verbal communication skills to convince someone. Um, while you are done your application package, also make sure that you're getting it reviewed by different people, whether it's through your peers um, or your advisor. So getting few faculty their eyes on it, getting your uh, lab mates' eyes on it. There's also the community called the Future PI uh, Slack, which the, has a lot of different fields where people who are on the market are constantly helping each other peer review stuff. Um, again, it goes back to those who are from international and from different countries. Don't feel like you are being arrogant. Self-advocacy is sort of the name of the game in the United States. You have to do a little bit of the humble bragging. Um, and small things to like really keep in mind, especially when you're putting like 50 odd applications together, make sure if you're saving stuff as PDF or converting them that any links that you put together, any formatting you did is staying consistent. All right, so that's what I had. And it looks like we have about five to 10 minutes for questions and I can see some chats come up. Um, and so let's get to that. Thank you so much, Sonali. It was great. And it's always nice to hear from you. And I really surprised when I, I when you talk about it's pretty similar to our grant submission as well. So you have to be consistent, you have to be just check the advertisement. It was really surprising to hear from them. So shall we get started from the questions, Corelli? Yes, please. Okay. So I can start with the first one. So uh, there's a question asking how far back in time should you go undergrad, but no high school. So curious about the how far we should, we should go back. Yeah, so recent experiences are better than dated experiences. So I always start with the most recent ones. Um, and in general, like you don't have to over convince someone as long as you have one to two good examples of, of a specific area 
that's good enough. But if you were someone like who was a valedictorian or something in your high school or undergrad, which is really distinctive, sure, add that, right? Like that's something that is only given to one out of hundreds of people, do add it. Thank you, Sonali. Um, so it's great to see that we have a lot of questions. We'll try to reply as much as we can. Uh, and so the next one is, how about reviewership? Do people highlight them? I mean, I'm presuming this is peer review of journal articles is the question. Um, if you do peer review, yes, please do highlight it. Um, in, in your leadership and professional experiences, write a specific section on, or in fact, like even what I end up doing is, I make a compelling research communication section separately and in the research communication section, you can have the publication section, your talk section, and then other sections like communicating for outreach or public engagement, peer review, et cetera, right? And so peer review is another way, either you can put it in the research communication section and or your leadership and professional experience section. And these days, again, I'm gonna make a, a case for this. These days you can do that in ORCID. Uh, you can link all of this together. And so the other thing that I did not highlight is due in my publications and as well, I think it's in my publications where I link my Google Scholar and ORCID ID. And uh, scientists especially, they look at your ORCID ID and in ORCID, you can actually put all of your publications, your peer reviews, et cetera, that's linked under the same ID. It's a catalog of everything that you've done. Okay, our next question, should we list awarded but declined fellowship? What if I have no personal grant application? That's the next one. So, I, I mean, if you've submitted fellowships, um, and especially if they're like really competitive ones, like F32 or K99s, even if you didn't get it, it's fine to write it up. Um, but if it's a small, like, no one knows about the fellowship. I don't know what the benefit of writing, whether you got it or not. Yeah. Uh, and so again, you have to make a decision on if this is a pretty visible and nationally recognized fellowship that even if you didn't get it, it shows the intent of you writing and you having the uh, experience of writing. Yeah, just go ahead and do it. Um, I will go with the next one. So about volunteer, volunteering and leadership experience, should we put external volunteering activities from uh, outside academia? Um, I would say yes, but you have to explain why. Um, and so if you have an internship in an industry, I would try and connect it to project management experience or you know, you have the something that connects with your research or teaching or, um, you know, some functional area that faculty are generally doing, right? And so if it's leadership, it's project management, it's research, connected to that, what, whatever that experience was. Okay, I think the next question is uh, about being an international student. So uh, if for students from another country, there is something else that we should mention in the CV. Um, I mean, it, people will look at it in your educational history, you are from some other country, but if you want to highlight that in your professional summary, you can, that you're an international scientist. Uh, generally, for folks in the field are pretty aware of the restrictions or number of available fellowships, et cetera, for international scientists. So they'll keep that in mind. Um, but, you know, this cover letter is more the place where you can talk more about your identity. The diversity statement is a place where you could be talking more about who you are and what it means in terms of as an international scientist, how you contribute to global diversity and what you would do through your research um, and your, you know, tenure as a faculty. Thank you, Sonali. Um, next question is about fellowship. Um, do we list them twice in both funding and award section or just list in fundings? So you, if you list them twice in the fellowship, like the, the bullet point under the postdoc research itself, if you got a fellowship, that was your idea listed there, but put something different under the same fellowship. So you may or may not have put the number of dollars you got 
under under your you know the postdoc experience there you just said this research idea won you of this fellowship but in the funding section what you can do is you can highlight or detail that fellowship itself that how many dollars it was how many years etc Thank you. And the next question, what about the, if you judge the poster or in conferences or symposium, where should where we should this information on our CV, I guess? Yeah, so that sort of thing should be on under science outreach um, or like science communication. Um, so uh, how important is the letter of recommendation and is there a time limit to submit uh to submit it during the application process if we are approaching deadlines yeah so the the application itself will tell you how many letters of recommendation they want um it's typically three to five and you at least have to meet the minimum buckets um and it should be included in the application material they make it pretty specific and so again before you get to the academic application cycle, pick your people, talk to them uh, already um, that I'm planning to apply. Would you be willing to write me a letter of recommendation? And in reality, if they ask you to write a draft, be ready to write a draft, which kind or show them a part of your application so that they can quickly write it up for you on your behalf. I yeah, know some that's people true. use I, I know some people, especially international people, I know this is getting recorded, but um folks <laughs> sometimes hire consultants to write that sort of stuff too. So if you want to put in a little bit of money to hire a writing consultant to write one template of letter of recommendation, go ahead do it. Well, I didn't know that. Well, yeah, we should always don't ask me for names. I don't know them, but I know that there are people who do that. Yeah, but I mean, we should always read it to writing our draft. Well, I, anyway, so the next question, is there a limit in the size or number of the pages for the CV? Academic CVs are more flexible, but try to keep it in three to five pages. Anything more like people are not reading. Um, I would say three is pretty much sort of like a standard size, especially for someone who's like entering faculty level um once you have become a faculty and every year you add on that your cv increases by a page or something um so we have a question i guess it's more like it's case by case uh depending on the institution uh but is it okay to send files in a blocked word uh document format generally again the applications will tell you that how they would want you to compile the package. Sometimes they are even detail oriented and they'll tell you the order of the package, like that start with the cover letter, et cetera. Um, but typically they try and say to put it as a PDF. Um, if they uh, allow a Word document, you can put in a Word doc document, but in that case, make sure your all of your comments from the reviews, et cetera, are cleaned up and none of those remain in the final version. Okay, one of our attending uh, attendees asking, can you repeat the platform tools and resources you can use to research uh, research institute, institutions and research agendas and possible collaboration, panels with packages and demographics, etc. Yeah, so I'm just putting those in the chat. The three I talked about is College Navigator and CES or National Centers for Education Statistics. And the third is HERD or uh, Higher Ed Research Development. Thank you, Sonali. Uh, yeah, that's great. The, this the next question, I think it's pretty recurrent. I heard that a lot. Uh, so what is professional experience? What is the difference between the research experience and list of positions? Yeah, so the research experience is specifically tied to your research projects that you've done, whether it's in your PhD or postdoc. Professional experience is more like at least in the academic context, um, something that's just outside of teaching and research, right? Like, so if you worked somewhere before your PhD, like whether you're coming from biotech, if you've had uh, business leadership, et cetera, experiences, um, those go into professional experience. 
Um, for the non-academic or like CVs or resumes, generally people don't make the distinction between uh, research and professional experience and they put everything under professional experience. Okay, I think a couple of few more questions if you are still willing to answer. Should sure, I go ahead? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, perfect. So we have tons of questions. So what you covered all of them. Uh, can you put a conference and uh, you attended even though you didn't present? Oh yeah, especially if it's a big conference, like in the RNA conferences, I went to the RNA Society conference. Um, generally speaking, the more people you can connect with and build your community with, people will remember you from a conference. <laughs> and the amount of times I've spent at like evening bars, talking to faculty members, just like getting to know the field and the people and who they are as human beings, it pay pays out in the long run. People remember you from conferences. So even if you did not, present it's always a really good networking exercise and also like you know the one thing that people don't think about is like through conferences you get get to kind of know the the big sort of trends and research areas people are focusing on what the future is and a lot of times you meet with editors of journals at conferences and so in the RNA conferences like you know every I feel like a lot of breakfast meeting like tables I sat on had one or two journal editors and they were just head hunting for research ideas and they were doing the same thing. They were looking at what the future of a research in that field is to kind of source out articles for their journal. And so you can always also ask like questions of editors, what are their focus, what kind of like research topics they are looking for. So the connections you make at conferences are valuable whether, whether you are presenting or not. Thank you. Um, next question, and we have like only another one after that. Uh, can we ask a, a letter of recommendation from uh, someone who doesn't know us personally, but is a big shot in our field? I mean, if it's the fourth or fifth letter of recommendation, perhaps, but make sure the three that you're sending are people who know you. Um, I always like to tell students and postdocs to prioritize the people who know you. And like their goodwill might be good enough that you may not need the big shot person in your field, especially if they don't know you and they may or may not be willing to really write a good one. It doesn't matter what like their signature may or may not matter in that like thing. Okay, thanks for answering all questions. And this is the last one. Are applications sent the day of the deadline considered the same day, uh, same as applications sent much earlier? <laughs> uh, unless and until they point out that they are going to have an early application mechanism or process, some of the applications will say there's an early application process where they'll start reading and reviewing the early application pool. All of them are being read at the same time. Um, some of the universities make it explicit that there is an early application and you know, they'll start it on whichever day, but the application re remains open after that too. If they say something like that, they're probably starting to review and screen on that date that they put together. Uh, Perfect. I yeah. heard, uh, just for people, uh, I know that it was like a big issue, like, and me, I would be in the job market this summer so uh we got like some advice uh for like all the deadlines because as you said like you may have to apply to 50 different job application and you need to stay organized and what some people uh suggest is to like organize uh, it in an excel file with mm -hmm. like all the institution the requirements the link if it sends the recommendation letter so I know it's out there uh, and yeah, and start early, right? Like fall is going to come and go when you are in the thick of things, at least start planning your application this like right now, if you're applying in this fall, late spring, early summer onwards, start putting your application materials and like start with the letters of recommendation because those take the longest. And so make sure that you have those covered and start the other parts of the application. Like after writing them, reviewing, et cetera, it takes at least three months to have a good package, template package together. Absolutely. Okay, I think we have no more okay. questions. Yeah, I think she, Sonali covered everything as always. Exactly. It was great talk. Thank you so much, Sonali.
Thank you for inviting me. And I'm as thrilled to see so many people join us and stay. <laughs> yeah, right. We were hours. over a hundred persons. So it was amazing. Yeah. Always a pleasure. Thanks a lot. Time. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much. Thanks everyone for joining us tonight. And yeah. stay tuned for our events. And if you want to be our member, just check our website and then send on our email. We will be receiving all of the information, sending the information on their way. Thank you very much. Have a good night. And Sonali, if you have uh, postdocs interesting in INET, uh, we want to join and represent Princeton in INET. Yeah, I'll, I'll let them know. I'm starting to work with a few postdocs. I think there were a few postdocs for Princeton. I recognize one or two at least. Um, and so, yeah, I'll share it with the, the postdoc population and see if someone wants to join. We, we can send also our flyer. Uh, that yeah, that'll be great. Indicates, yeah, okay. I will send the, our flyer to you. So it would be great if you could adver advertise or share on your institution. Happy to do it. That Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a good night. Bye.